lifting up Jesus, opening his word from Australia, Denmark, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, Singapore, South Africa, United Kingdom, Thailand, the Philippines, United States, and throughout the world. You're watching Morial TV. Hi, this is Tim from Morial TV and Morial Radio here with uh, James Jacob Prash, live in Israel. Uh, Jacob, this is a question within a question. I have the question. Look, fortunately, I have a solid church uh, that I go to, but uh, we get a lot of questions from believers about uh, it, from New Zealand to Pittsburgh, all across the globe, of what church can I go to? Now, we find that, that Paul in the book of Acts had the very same problem. As he was leaving Ephesus, he literally wept because he knew that grievous wolves would enter in among you, not sparing the flock, and also of yourselves. Uh, th that means people in the ranks shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. We find we have the same problem these days, and there are a lot of wolves in sheep's clothing. Uh, one of them, I would suggest, is uh, Randy White, Dr. Randy White. Uh, again, not the Randy White that's the ex-husband of, of Paula White, but the uh, Randy White who is into hyper-dispensationalism, and he's also into what's, what some would call another gospel. Yes. Look, I'm in Israel at the moment, in Galilee. I was recently in the Far East. Uh, I'm due back in Britain, then America soon. It's all over the world, as you say. This is a problem globally. More and more believers are leaving denominational churches, going to independent fellowships, or house churches and meeting in small groups. They've had it with the institutionalized church. Not because they're in rebellion against the institution itself, but because the institutions have departed so far from the word of God and the denominations have compromised so much by and large. It's a global problem. Now concerning Randy White, he is from a Baptist background. He was the pastor of a church in the outskirts of Houston in KT, Texas. Then he relocated to the Taos area of New Mexico. I don't know where he got his doctorate. I don't know anything about his academic credentials. I can't speak to that. But I can speak about his doctrine. Randy White is a hyper, hyper dispensationalist. He's a hyper dispensationalist on steroids. He's not simply a John Darby dispensationalist or a Cyrus Schofield dispensationalist. Those things are false enough. John Darby went so far as to say, the Sermon on the Mount is mainly not for Christians, it's for unsaved Jews. That the Epistle of James is not for believers, it's not written to the church, it's for unsaved Jews. And he does the same thing with the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24. He says it's not for Christians, it's not for Jews. The only way you can arrive at the pre-trib arguments of Darby's school of dispensationalism is to subscribe to his hyper-dispensational hermeneutic. Do you believe that the Epistle of James is not for believers? Do you believe the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus was not speaking for believers, only for unsaved Jews? Well, that's what Darby said of Matthew 24. Why would Jesus speak that way to unsaved Jews? Following Darby was his American protege, Cyrus Schofield, again a convicted swindler who was sent to prison for embezzlement. No theological training, he was a crooked lawyer uh, and the, a professional fraudster. This was Schofield. Well, beyond Schofield and Darby, you have Bullinger and those who follow Bullinger. These people who were opposed by uh, a number of major evangelical leaders, including other dispensationalists. They were opposed uh, by Harry Ironside, who was a dispensationalist, taught that uh, the Gospels are not for Christians at all, that Christianity only begins in the Book of Acts. Well, then you have Randy White, who goes beyond that. Randy White is so extreme in the hyper-dispensationalism that began with Darby, the errors of Darby, that then mushroomed, 
through Bullinger and through Schofield, that he teaches that the church is not under the new covenant, that born-again believers in Jesus are not under the new covenant. They're not under the old covenant, but neither are they under the new covenant. They are rather under, quote-unquote, the mediator, a false teaching he arrives at by comporting passages in the book of Hebrews out of all reasonable exegetical context. He says, we're under the mediator. Well, Jesus is the mediator of the new and better covenants. There is no functional distinction between being under the new covenant and the one who mediated it, except in his mind. He goes so far as to say, Mr. Randy White goes so far as to say that the seven churches in Revelation are not churches. They're a prophecy of seven Jewish synagogues that will exist after the rapture during the 70th week of Daniel, during the tribulation, as he calls the last seven years, again, erroneously, calling the full seven years the tribulation, that there's seven Jewish synagogues. They're not even churches. This is extremely, extremely false. Exceptionally false. Again, he's another example of the problem. If you were going to embrace pre-tribulationism, you must understand, you must take on board hyper-dispensationalism as the basis for it. That is where Darby got his means to teach it. It's not for the church. It's only for the Jews. Don't take it literally. It's not for us. It's for the Jews. That's what he did. What he did with the Sermon on the Mount, that's not for us, not for believers. What he did with the Epistle of James, that's not for us, that's not for believers. That's what he did with Matthew 24, 25. Luke 21, the Olivet Discourse. This stuff's not for us. Well, Randy White was on the same road as Darby. Darby put his followers on the wrong road, and Randy White has simply traveled down that road further than other people. The hyper-dispensational highway to hell. That's what it is. Now let's understand the real problem with him. Yes, he says crazy things that have upset many people, even dispensationalists, such as that Israel, not the church, is the bride of Christ, such as, you know, that the seven churches are seven synagogues in Revelation 2 and 3, and that Christians are not under the new covenant. They're under only the mediator. The new covenant hasn't happened yet, he says. Well, that's contrary to what Jesus said when he inaugurated the new covenant at the Last Supper, but that is his teaching. The question is, how did he get into evangelical circles? Even discernment circles have opened the door to Randy White. How did such a fundamental heretic, it is quite plausibly argued that he has a different gospel, that you're saying that by his death and resurrection, Jesus has not brought us into the new covenant. He has a different gospel, many people would say. And it's a plausible argument. How does he make these inroads? How do people welcome him, give him platform, church invitations, put him on radio? What's wrong with people that will do this? This comes about by the false criteria. The false criteria. I am not a cessationist. I do not believe the gifts of the Spirit, the charismatic gifts, ended with the apostles. By experience and theology, I am moderately charismatic slash Pentecostal, small p, small c. But by experience, and first of all, by doctrinal theology, I am not a cessationist. I think cessationism, as taught by John MacArthur and others, is a false teaching. But I think that hyper-Pentecostalism and hyper-charismatic extremism, that is neo-Montanism, that's the theological term for such things, are also false doctrines. There have been many Pentecostals and Charismatics who have done things like ma making Charismata, or at least a, a, a um, oh, hold it there, 
or at least a profession of believing in charismata, the criteria for establishing orthodoxy. He prays in tongues, he must be right. I remember the clowning in tongues mockery between Kenneth Copeland and Rodney Howard Brown. And Rodney Howard Brown's defense of it, his apologetic for the laughing drunken counterfeit revival was, don't try to understand it. How many of you pray in tongues? Don't understand it in the natural. And the way he was twisting Bible verses out of context to justify the chicanery that some described as blasphemous and even demonic, but it was certainly not the Holy Spirit with that kind of mockery and craziness, clowning in tongues. Oh, they're doing it in tongues. It must be of God. Oh, well, the born-again Catholics. I know they're praying in tongues to Mary. They're praying to the dead. They're engaging in the sin of necromancy, but they're praying in tongues. They must be all right. I've seen that. If they're praying in tongues, they must be all right. They make that the seal of divine approval. They make that the certification of divine approval. They make it the certification of doctrinal orthodoxy. They must be brothers. Their doctrine must be right. They're speaking in tongues, languages, whatever. Now, I believe in a biblical gift of tongues, even though I don't believe most of what we see is authentic. But it's not the sign of orthodoxy. It's not the seal of divine approval. I've seen the same false criteria with some of the King James only people, <coughs> particularly the Ruckmanites and the devotees of the fraudster, Gail Ripplinger, whose degree is in home economics. You can't even read Greek or Hebrew. Oh, they read the King James. They must be right. Wait a minute. Peter Ruckman was on his third marriage. Get divorced and remarried, divorced and remarried, and he's remarried again. Oh, but he reads the King James. He must be all right. They make what version of the Bible you read the seal of divine approval, the test of orthodoxy. That becomes the litmus test if you're true or false, of God or not of God. Now, I have no problem with the King James. God has used it. It's a valid translation, although it is not without error. It is a valid translation. Something like the message is not a valid translation. The King James is, despite its archaic language. <coughs> Wonderful for its prose and a valid translation. But it's not the test of orthodoxy. Yet I've seen people are willing to overlook immorality, divorce, remarriage, all kinds of things. Oh, but he's King James only, must be all right. That is not the seal of divine approval. Now pre-trib has become the same thing. Not all pre-tribulationists are like this. There are pre-tribulationists whom, although I disagree with them on the timing of the rapture, I agree with them on the doctrine of the rapture, and I have otherwise a high regard for them as Bible expositors, such as Dr. Arnold Fruchtenbaum, and Dr. Mark Hitchcock. I hold those guys in considerable regard, even though we may disagree on certain points to do with the timing of the rapture. They're not all like this, but there is a growing element that has become like this. He's pre-trib, he must be all right. Pre-tribulationism is the seal of divine approval. Pre-tribulationism is God's litmus test. Pre-tribulationism is the certificate of all authenticity. You know, what about Christology? What do you think of Christ? What about the fruit of the Spirit? You'll know them by their fruits. You know, what about the gospel? Do they believe a different gospel? Let them be accursed. The biblical standards of authenticity, the biblical standards of divine approval, the scriptural standards of, of, of certification of orthodoxy are ignored as long as he's pre-trib or as long as they're King James only or as long as they pray in tongues or whatever. People make a false criteria and they're doing it now with pre-trib just as others have done it with tongues and as others and languages and as others have done it with Bible versions. Now they're doing it with pre-trib. He must be all right. 
So they're closing the door on other believers who believe the rapture, but place it at a different time than they do. And you're talking about people like A.W. Tozer, Dr. Walter Martin, Charles Spurgeon, Corey Tenboom. None of these people were pre-trip. But you slam the door on them, and you open the door to an out-and-out -out heterodox heretic like Randy White. Because he's pre-trib, he must be all right. He's in the club. He's one of us. He's acceptable. What? A man who says we're not under the new covenant as born-again believers in Jesus? An extreme hyper-dispensationalist, a man who's hyper-dispensationalism goes beyond hyper-dispensationalism. Oh, but he's pre-trib, he must be all right. Let him in. Put him on the radio. Give him a platform. Send him an invitation. This is dangerous. Being pre-trib is not the divine seal of approval. It is not the design, it is not the divine certificate of orthodoxy. It is not God's litmus test of being doctrinally solid or spiritually solid. It's not. But people have made it that. Hence, he has made inroads into evangelical circles. Even discernment ministries have foolishly given him platform. This is wrong. This is dangerous. It is a false criteria. The divine certificate of orthodoxy is not pre-trib, or what version of the Bible you read, or whether or not you speak in tongues. Those are not God's criteria. Those are the criteria of men, not of God. Now again, I'm not attacking my pre-trib brethren personally. Many of them are godly people who love the Lord as I do. We agree on the rapture. We agree on most things apart from its timing. Let's discuss it. Let's not divide. That's always been my attitude. I'm not attacking the King James. It is a valid translation. God has used it. I sometimes read it myself. I'm not attacking tongues. I believe there is a biblical gift of tongues. And yes, I've done it myself. But that's neither here nor there. To the present, not, it's not germane to the present conversation. But none of these things is a test. They are not God's test. They are not God's certificate of orthodoxy. In Randy White, you have blatant heterodoxy, open heresy. But he was let in simply because he was pre trib This is wrong, and it is dangerous. And this kind of problem is getting worse. The faithful believers, no matter what their position on the timing of the rapture, need to realize this danger. Thank you so much for your question. My name is James Jacob Prash, coming to you this week live from Galilee, Israel. Shalom lehitarot kol tuf, Adonai Yavrechem. Greetings of Jesus, this is your friend Jacob Prash speaking to you at the moment from the UK. You know, so many of the questions we get in our Roku broadcast and our Vimeo clips and on YouTube deal with subjects that we deal with much more extensively in our books. We can't, for the sake of brevity, uh, go into the kind of depth in a TV broadcast we can actually go into in a book. But so many of the questions come from material that are expounded in the books on a much more broader scale that it's almost frustrating sometimes that we can't spend hours and hours answering a, 
at the questions that, that are given to us. Obviously, practicality dictates that's not a possibility. The books are there. They're available. They're available in print through the Moriel catalog on the Moriel website, moriel.org. But in this day of Kindle and electronic books, they're also available through Amazon and they're available through Kindle. Kindle. The three books that would be the most referred to in the questions we receive are the three latest books. The first being The Dilemma of Laodicea. The Dilemma of Laodicea is an exposition of the seven churches in Revelation, culminating with the final two churches, Philadelphia and Laodicea particularly, setting the stage for the return of Jesus. The Dilemma of Laodicea would be the first. The second would be Shadows of the Beast. Shadows of the Beast. How the coming Antichrist, how his identity will be revealed to the faithful church. The rapture will not happen. Will not happen, absolutely not happen, until the faithful church knows who the ultimate beast of Revelation is. That is the Antichrist and also the false prophet. How the identity of the coming Antichrist will be revealed to the faithful church Shadows of the Beast, the second book. And the final and latest one, Harpezo. Harpezo, what the scripture actually teaches about the rapture, the snatching away which takes place between the sixth and seventh seals in the book of Revelation. So these three books, The Blum of Laodicea, Shadows of the Beast, and Harpezo, all available on the Morio catalog, all available through Amazon, and all easily available electronically by Kendall. Thank you so much, dear friends. God bless. May Jesus be with you.